Welcome to In the Lighthouse, your safe harbor from the storm, with your host, the Lighthouse Keeper, Daphne Collins. Hello, and welcome to this special Christmas edition of In the Lighthouse, your safe harbor from the storm. This is Daphne Collins, your Lighthouse Keeper. I'm so glad that we've chosen to take a break from our regular programming to reflect on this time of year when we once again celebrate the birth of our Lord and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah whose coming was first promised by God Almighty and later foretold through the centuries by His prophets. But why exactly do we celebrate? Well, for the believer of Jesus Christ, it's a celebration of that promise made and fulfilled by our holy and faithful God, a fulfillment of good news given in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve before they were cast out from the abiding presence of God. In Genesis 3.14, God cursed the misbegotten serpent and the evil one controlling its actions. To this serpent he said, On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And on the evil force controlling the serpent, Satan, God declared war. In verse 15 he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What Adam and Eve overheard from God's pronouncement to the serpent was what is known as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. The very basis of our faith as Christians stems from the forgiveness of the cosmic treason committed in the Garden of Eden. All of humanity and nature was cursed because of Adam's sin, but God promised the Savior who would take the curse of sin and death upon himself and crush Satan's power. The ravages of sin and its consequences are seen throughout the generations and continue to this day. The curse of enmity, war, between good and evil men is still present today as we bear witness to the downward spiral of our culture into wickedness and darkness. This darkness is not new to humanity. It happened countless times in our world ever since Adam and Eve were ejected from God's presence. This is where our story begins. It takes place during a time of great unrest and authoritarian rule. Fear was palpable and the people were crying out to God for the promised Messiah. Time has a way of showing that some patterns are often repeated. We speak of ancient days, but in essence, the same spirit of unrest at work then is at work in our world today. This narrative is entitled, A Light in the Darkness, and is a story about hope amid hopelessness. Love, when it feels as if there is none to be found, peace when we need it most, and joy because our King is coming again. Okay, let's get started. Mistakes are typically repeated because of our failure to learn the lessons of the past. We plunge headlong into the next venture without humbly taking measured consideration. The Bible has been the proven reliable historical resource to reference in order not to pursue the folly of previous generations. Have we demonstrated that we've learned our lesson? Before we take a journey into our far distant past, let's first examine the world as we see it today. I challenge you, listener, to look closely at our world through eyes of honesty, even if you're not willing to admit it openly to someone you know because you want to avoid any potential conflict. 
The truth is, we live in this world. Therefore, we must partake of the chaos that we have knowingly or unknowingly caused. Ask yourself this. If God knew about the sin introduced to Adam and Eve in the garden, which resulted in the fall of all creation, and placed the curse of enmity between Satan and the woman's seed, is he also aware of what's happening now? Events just over the past few years are seen and will be judged by God. A world pandemic perpetrated by nefarious actors, abortion of babies in the womb, racial tension and division, witchcraft and divination, homosexuality and the transgender movement, corrupt world governments, judicial systems, and oligarchies, military coups and proxy wars, abuse and trafficking of women and children, forcible imprisonment of people in their homes under the guise of safety, mass suicide, and murder. These are only a few things seen by God for which humanity will be judged. When you look at it honestly, do you feel hope in your heart? Or do you feel that evil has triumphed? The overwhelming escalation of evil in our world indicates that there is a fervor of spiritual darkness overwhelming the sin natures of anyone it can devour. The Apostle Peter gave warning of this centuries ago. In 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. If you regularly read your Bible, you will know that these same problems were present in the book of Genesis. Sin is active in our natures and has been present throughout human history. And we have an enemy at war with us. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The truth remains. The same force behind the first temptation in the Garden of Eden is at work in the world today. All of humanity falls prey to its influences because of our sin nature that began from choices made in the Garden. The hopelessness we feel today was also felt centuries ago in the ancient Near East. The world was enshrouded in darkness because of the evil forces at work under the iron fist of the conquering Roman Empire. The people of the land, the Israelites, had been under oppressive rule from conquering nations, which was foretold by prophets who warned the ruling kings of Israel and Judah before their conquest and subsequent exile from the land. But not all of the kings took heed to these warnings and continued in their sin of idolatry which brought forth the judgment of God upon the people, the destruction of the great Solomonic temple in Jerusalem, and the end of their line of kings. Although many returned to the land, others remained dispersed and were governed by outside forces through puppet rulers. Moreover, the people no longer heard from God. The times of the prophets had ended centuries earlier. As it was in the days of the judges, the people cried out to God from their darkness. When you cry out to God and don't receive an answer right away, do you lose hope? Do you stop believing? Do you think God isn't listening to your prayer? Before the silence over Israel, the prophets who were sent by God spoke to the kings of Israel and Judah with utterances concerning situations that were to occur in their present or the very distant future of the nation. However, centuries before the kings heard anything from their prophets, God established a covenant with Abraham. He told Abraham that through his offspring, 
all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And to Abraham's grandson Jacob, God said, A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. Also to Jacob, through his prophet Balaam, God said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. God conferred upon Jacob at Bethel the name Israel, and reaffirmed the covenantal promise made to his father and grandfather that the land of Canaan would come to him through his sons. The seed of the woman, according to Matthew's gospel, prospered through the fourteen generations from Abraham to his descendant David, the son of Jesse. David's kingship was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And to David, God continued his covenantal promise with a message through his prophet Samuel. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In Psalm 132, a song of ascent, the Lord God declares to David, One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Let's take a moment for this short break. When we return... We will continue with our special Christmas edition of A Light in the Darkness. In Luke chapter 2, the angel of the Lord said to the shepherds, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. To believe this and bear witness, they would need a sign, and the angel gave it. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Swaddling clothes? Why, every baby in Bethlehem was wearing swaddling clothes. That's not the sign. The sign is the manger. In fact, this must have sounded crazy. The shepherds probably didn't think they heard the angel correctly. You see, no other king anywhere in the world was lying in a feeding trough. Find him, and you find the king of kings. Who was this king lying in that feeding trough? He is the Savior, Luke says, the Christ, the Lord. Believe in him, and receive the free gift of eternal life. Beloved, don't let this Christmas season pass without looking into that feeding trough and recognizing the sign spoken of by the angel. Find him, and you will find the king of kings. Believe in Him and receive the free gift of eternal life. Praise the Lord. This is Lane Wilder for Carry the Light Ministries, bringing you insights from an elder. Welcome back. We will now continue with A Light in the Darkness. The Lord God blessed the nation as he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the sin of Adam continued to flourish in the hearts and minds of God's people. His prophets warned the kings not to turn the people's hearts away from God. Their idolatry was rampant in God's sight. Divine judgment would come to the people and the land. 
Despite the many blessings, the next generations of kings following David, with the exception of a few godly kings, were fourteen, from David to the last king, Josiah. Eliakim was not included in Matthew's genealogy because he was one of the puppet kings appointed by the pharaoh Necho in Egypt to rule and tax the people. The people of Judah were taken into captivity in Babylon for 70 years, but before the fall of Jerusalem, God was still speaking through his prophets. Years before they were taken away, the prophet Micah, a contemporary of the prophets in the northern kingdom of Israel, Isaiah and Hosea, spoke against the elite ruling class of the southern kingdom, Judah. These elite rulers cheated the poor for financial gain. Micah warned King Hezekiah about the destruction of Jerusalem. There was much wickedness in their culture because of greed, idolatry, and depravity, which brought about the invasion of the northern kingdom from the Assyrians. However, Judah did not learn from Israel's folly, and Micah foretold of the destruction coming for the southern kingdom. To the priests and rulers of Judah, his message from God was simple. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To the poor living on the fringes of society, Micah reminded them of the faithfulness of God and his covenant promise to Abraham. In Micah 5, verses 2 through 5, he said, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. His message to them was one of tidings of joy. A Messiah would come to them by way of their little town. His was a message of hope. As it was in the days earlier, so too did the cycle of sin return, but with more progression to Judah. Then God sent the prophet Jeremiah to reiterate the same message of Micah to King Jehoiakim, the wicked puppet ruler concerning the siege of Jerusalem. But it was too late and the city fell to the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar's armies, and the people were taken into exile from the land. Fourteen generations would pass from Jeconiah, the last Davidic king taken into exile in Babylon, up to the birth of Jesus. During this exilic period, God continued to speak through a few prophets, including Daniel and Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, who was in Egypt. Ezekiel received a vision of the glory of God leaving the Solomonic Temple in Jerusalem before it was looted. He, too, received visions of the coming Messiah. However, the people were in exile in a foreign land, and, as the prophet Jeremiah advised, they began to build their lives and wait the opportunity to return. He sent an encouraging message to the people, saying, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, 
and Israel will dwell securely. For the people who remained in the land, as with those in exile, they witnessed empires rise and fall, each with a despotic ruler crueler than the last. The days of the prophets were over, and there was silence in the land for four hundred years. Amid the gloom of silence, the people of the land survived the diaspora from Israel. Change occurred as their language and culture was grafted into that of the conquering empires that ruled the land, as Daniel prophesied. Their current and harshest rule, however, came from Rome with its authoritarian client states. In the days of Caesar Augustus, when Herod the Great's rule as client king over Judea was entering its twilight years and Quirinius governed Syria, God began to act on behalf of his people, Israel. Gabriel, a messenger angel, was sent by God to earth to speak to a priest named Zechariah to tell him that his barren wife, who was also beyond the age of giving birth, would become pregnant and have a son whose name would be John. More than four centuries before Gabriel appeared before Zechariah with this message, the prophet Malachi prophesied, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The fullness of time had come. For seven hundred years before Gabriel appeared before Zechariah, the prophet Isaiah uttered this message. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Luke's Gospel, Gabriel appeared again to deliver another message, but this time it was to a teenaged girl named Mary, a virgin from the small town of Nazareth in the city of Galilee. She was betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Gabriel's initial greeting was unusual to her because he didn't want to alarm her. He told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. In response to Mary's natural question of how, knowing herself to be a virgin, Gabriel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. He told Mary of her relative, Elizabeth, who was already six months pregnant and would soon give birth to a son to Zechariah. Upon hearing this report, Mary readily accepted his message and said, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. How many of us would accept such a message? Is it in our nature to hear such news and believe without question? There is, however, a small glitch in this unfolding drama. Mary, the teenaged virgin, is betrothed to Joseph. How can this be explained to him, to her parents, and to her community? The expectation of the betrothal is that the bride will be chaste and pure. But the angel said something before he left her presence. For nothing is impossible with God. 
Mary was not to concern herself over these matters. They were already well within God's plan, and all would come to right for Mary and Joseph. Well, as it goes, in Matthew's Gospel account, Mary's fiancé, Joseph, upon hearing her news, was considering a quiet release from their betrothal contract. However, the very busy Gabriel came to Joseph in a dream to let him know the circumstances of Mary's conception and that this occurrence is the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Moreover, Joseph was chosen by God to be her spouse and the father of the child who is to be named Jesus. The caveat to all of this is that he was not to wed Mary until after the birth of the child, which was to fulfill the prophecy of the virgin birth. Our narrative continues with Joseph and Mary embarking on a journey from Nazareth in Galilee to their final destination, the little town of Bethlehem in Judea. The reason for their journey was due to a requirement decreed by Caesar Augustus for all throughout the empire to register for a census. Joseph took his betrothed and child to register them in his home district of Bethlehem. By this time, Mary was quite near to her expected delivery of the baby and had been traveling with Joseph over land by cart and donkey. Yet, being a young woman, she bore the journey and they arrived in Bethlehem as her labor began. There was no place for Joseph to bring Mary to comfortably deliver the child, so he was directed to an adjoining stable near the local inn where the animals were kept. In this stable, Joseph cleared a place where Mary could give birth, and he cleaned out a feeding trough to act as a manger for them to lay the babe. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Out in the cold night, there were shepherds keeping watch over their flocks. When out of the darkness, a bright light shone above them, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Instantaneously the heavens opened, and before their eyes, appearing with the messenger, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. It was to the lowliest in their culture, except for perhaps the bond slave, that God sent the first tidings. And with these glad tidings came a spectacular light show and angelic singing of which no ear has ever heard on this side of heaven. Their song of praise reflected the prophecy of Isaiah centuries earlier. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These shepherds, upon hearing such glad tidings, said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem 
and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried to find the small family huddled in the cold of night in that lowly stable in Bethlehem. These men abandoned their only source of income, their sheep in the fields, to find this special baby whose birth was heralded by angels in the heavens. Everyone was in their respective districts to register for a man-made census by decree from an authoritarian ruler out of Rome. King Herod, the one who had been crushing them with taxation to fund his many building projects, was plotting to find out the identity of the prophesied messianic king. The hope for the people of the land had been crushed under empires that rose and fell. Yet the people waited. God was silent for 400 years, and it felt as if all hope was gone. Then suddenly there appeared a light in the darkness, with singing and rejoicing. A message of hope and peace was given to the lowest among them. They were given a front row seat to the birth of their Messiah. The shepherds found Mary and Joseph and saw the baby lying in the manger, and they returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, which was just as the angel had told them. I pray that this journey through prophecy in the Bible has given you a better understanding if not, a reminder of the reason for celebrating the birth of Jesus. When you consider all the news you hear in a given day, and much of it bad, be reminded of the good news heard by those shepherds during the Roman occupation. When all seems lost, because God was silent for centuries, the people remained hopeful, and God remembered His covenant promise of a Messiah. Let their story encourage you to remember that God loved this world so much that He sent His only Son to be born in a humble stable and laid in a manger which was a feeding trough meant for the animals. He chose for Him to be parented by a young peasant girl and her honorable husband who would protect his family at all costs by the leading of the Lord. Jesus came into this world to be our light in the darkness. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you so much for joining me for this special Christmas edition of In the Lighthouse. I hope you enjoyed this prophetic journey through Scripture, which led us to that first Christmas as we follow the shepherds to the manger to be the first to see a light in the darkness. If you enjoyed what you heard, you might have some insightful comments that you would like to share with us. If that's the case, please email us at thelighthouse at carrythelightministries.com. Transcripts for this and all future episodes can be found in our show notes. We welcome you to visit The Lighthouse on the web at www.carrythelightministries.com and follow us, share us, and like us on social media. I'm your Lighthouse Keeper, Daphne Collins, along with the family at Carry the Light Ministries, wishing you and yours a light of peace and hope at Christmas and in the new year. Until next time, be blessed.